Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. Joining me today is the OG chastity speaker, Jason Everett himself, but he's written a new book called Male, Female, Other? Question mark, a Catholic Guide to Understanding Gender. And I'm really excited that he wrote this book because there's not a lot of resources on this topic, even though many people are talking about it. It's in the news all the time. I remember back in 2015, I told my wife, Laura, maybe I should write a book on the transgender stuff. And she said, oh, that's never going to catch on. And well, look where we are today. My wife is right about a lot of things, but she will admit she was wrong about that one. But I'm really excited for this book to be something that's practical to equip people to engage others on this issue in an intellectual way, but also in a compassionate way so that we can speak the truth, but we can do so in love to others. So without further ado, Jason, welcome to the podcast. Grant, thanks for having me on. So uh, what were you seeking to do with this particular book? Because a lot of people talk about it. Like I said, there weren't a lot of books on this subject. There was the one by Ryan Anderson with the cheeky title, When Harry Became Sally. Mm -hmm. Uh, What were you hoping to add to the public discussion with this particular book? Yeah, well, Ryan's book is terrific. I mean, extremely sharp, awesome guy, uh, terrific gift for the church. Um, But what I started to notice is Molly travels to the schools, you know, I get to a school and the principal, I'm like, yeah, we've got six kids in the elementary school that identify as trans or non-binary, you know, and these things are happening in the classroom. And then the teacher asks the principal, like, what's our policy? And the principal's like, oh, we don't have a policy. Let's ask the pastor. Pastor's like, well, I didn't go to seminary to learn about non-binary trans. I, I don't know. Let's ask the bishop. Bishop's like, oh, I don't know. Does another archdiocese have a policy we can use? it? They're just scrambling for answers. And I think as a church, we've done an, you know, a decent job of giving kind of an intellectual response to this topic of treating it like an ideology and this is why it's not in line with Catholic anthropology, but it's almost like we're treating it solely as an ideology while sometimes overlooking the individuals who didn't choose to wrestle with this issue. A lot of people think, oh, that's those left wing trans people. It's like, wait a minute. There's young people, old people wrestling with gender dysphoria, perhaps in our pews on Sunday mass. And you might not realize like, hey, they're wondering, okay, is there room in the church for me to navigate the questions I have with this lack of congruence I feel with my body and my identity? And I'm meeting these teens, meeting these parents wrestling with this question. My kid wants me to use their preferred pronoun. My daughter wants top surgery. What do we do? I met one dad and his son wanted to have bottom surgery. And I talked to the boy, talked to the dad and the dad said, you know what? Later he said, I think I'm just going to let the kid have it. And that way, when he regrets it, that can be his punishment. And I'm like, oh boy, like we need something to give these parents. We need something to give the children, the young people, the teenagers wrestling with gender dysphoria that will actually unite charity with clarity. Like you said in the intro, it isn't just about truth, but how do we deliver that with love? And so the intention behind the book was to give them the intellectual ammo that a college kid could stand before their gender studies professor and go toe to toe with them, with the data on intersex conditions and this and that, but something you could also hand somebody that's wrestling with this or a parent of how do I pastorally accompany this kid without compromising the truth or risk them committing suicide. And so something that could set the pastoral tone while giving them the intellectual answers by what the church teaches. Do you think a lot of times we have a problem amongst Catholics where we'll look at an issue, we'll only understand it as the arguments for and against it, and we mm-hmm. just treat those who hold that view as just, oh, they're the opposition, the opponents. There's these crazy people on cable mm-hmm. news. And then we're kind of caught speechless when it's someone at our school or in our church who is not an ideologue. It's just someone who is genuinely struggling. And we put them in a box mm-hmm. and suddenly we're not really equipped to talk about it. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly what happens. We inadvertently get impacted by this drive-by media of just these talking heads bickering back and forth uh, just to increase their ratings. And it's like, well, wait a minute, that's not the approach. I remember <laughs> reading of a guy, uh, the University of Essex over in England came out on their gender website saying that there's an infinite number of genders. And some guy's like, okay, I've had enough. And so he sends them an email and said, hey, can you send me the list? You got there, the infinite number of genders. So they emailed them a list of 23. And he said, really, if there's an infinite number, you could at least give me 500. And they emailed him back and they said, well, you know, some of these genders are unknown or unrecognized. And he's like, well, how can you count them if they're unknown? And he actually used a Freedom of Information Act to try to get them to cough up all these genders. 
and emailed him and he said, you know what, might I suggest the reason you can't furnish me the list of an infinite number of genders is one, it would take you forever to write the list. Right. And secondly, even if you did write the list, the entire universe could not contain it, even if you used really tiny font. And that right. was the end of their discussion. Did he win the debate? Hands down, he did. Who's better off though for this? Like nobody. So it's like on one right. side, you had a guy looking at all the logical inconsistencies, but he probably doesn't know a single person by name that experiences gender dysphoria. Then you had the people like, like the trans alliance, whatever on campus that don't really spend a lot of time intellectually thinking this through, but are spending a lot of time with the people going through this. And it's like, okay, what if charity and clarity could kind of meet and have a beer? What would that look like for us right. to actually enter into these people's lives instead of belittling them, listen to their stories and gradually with love, try to lead them to the truth. So let, walk us through that then. Uh, the book, I'll reference a few parts here or there, but it covers 18 gender theory claims mm -hmm. uh, to help people to understand some more of the terms here, like gender as a social construct, sex is assigned at birth. So it seems like you start with a lot of definitions, mm -hmm. uh, helping people to understand the issue. And then the second half of the book is a lot more application, surgeries, bathrooms, uh, regret people might have, how educators should engage the issue. But how, yeah, I guess, well, maybe, maybe we should start with the, the bigger picture. And then my follow up will be, what do you do when you sit down with mm -hmm. someone? Because I guess that's important, right? When you sit down with someone, if you are totally confused about things like sex assigned at birth, or gender identity, you're more likely to have a tense or difficult conversation with someone. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, maybe what, what your book helps people to do is, okay, let's just break down these terms so we understand it. And then when you talk to someone, you can say, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with that term, but maybe you use it differently. You're in a better place to have a good conversation. So maybe we can talk about those those terms a little, give people a little crash course, like gender identity, sex assigned at birth, like sex and gender. Because even people on the other side, they're they're ambiguous how they use the terms as well. Oh, yeah. No, and, and that's the key is that we can very easily be talking past each other where we're thinking by gender, they mean sex. And so they're trying to change their sex. And then we dig into the ammo showing, well, wait a minute, look at this. Every cell of the human body is sex. You can't change your sex. And then you start pointing out male and female biological differences that are immutable. And we're thinking, okay, I'm really scoring a lot of debate points here. And in their brain, you could go all day long. It's like, look, I don't care if they found 6,500 sex specific genes, if my arteries are male and female, my you know bone structure is male or female, like I'm not saying that I'm changing my sex. What I'm saying is that I'm shaping my body in such a way with hormones or surgeries or whatever, so that it's more in conformity with my internal sense of self. And so here we are kind of shooting off all these arguments that have no weight to them because we think that they mean that sex is equal to gender, gender but that's not what they mean at all. And that's why it gets so confusing because gender could mean so many different things. Like it right. could mean the grammar and language. It could mean biological sex. It could mean social roles. It could be your sense of gender identity, this transgender belief that you have intellectually. And so first step, when you sit down, we got to listen. It's right. not like, let me just give you the best argument. Like I want to understand where you're coming from. I, I remember one evangelical pastor, he said, look, if someone in your parish church comes up to you and identifies as trans, here's what you do. He said, you say, look, I, I feel like I'm kind of meeting you in chapter eight of your life, but I haven't had the opportunity to learn about chapters one through seven, but I'd really like to. Could we do coffee sometime? That's what you do. And then you sit and you listen because you want them to walk away from that conversation, not convinced, oh, wow, I am convinced of Catholic anthropology. You want them to walk away being like, that person really listened to me. Yeah. They, they really heard me out. I feel heard by that person. And that's going to make them want to come to listen again, that you're doing some reflective listening. And wow, that must have been really difficult. And I, I'm sorry, you know, if sometimes you felt that Christians look at you like you're invisible or you don't exist, that must be really hard. So you're doing reflexive listening. You're wanting to build a relationship with this person. And then in time, we can deliver them the truth mm -hmm. as that relationship deepens. And we've got to understand this is very sensitive territory here. I, I find talking, it's almost like treating a burn victim in some respects. Like you yeah. just touch, it's like, ah, it's like, okay, well, all right, maybe that was an overreaction of sensitivity, but instead of faulting them for that, maybe I just need to be a little more gentle in how I nuance and approach this tough issue. So when you have a conversation with someone, then does that mean you might ask them a question like, do you identify as, like, let's say it's a 
biological female who is a transgender man. So a biological mm -hmm. female identifies, though this could be hard, so maybe you should ask a question like, do you identify as a man or male? Like, is do people make that mm -hmm. difference in, in sex versus gender? Like being, being, they might say something like, I am a woman, but I identify as male. Is that what you're kind of getting at where they oh, might yeah. say, yeah, I'm not changing my sex. I'm just saying yeah. my gender identity is different. Yeah. And, and everybody's different. When I find these conversations, some people might concede I'm not female, but I am a man. You okay. know, like, like, so, or I, you know, I'm, bi or I am biologically female, but I identify as a man. So making distinctions between man and male and woman and female. And for a lot of people's brains, it starts like slowing down, like a video game glitching. Like when we're trying to understand this stuff, right. like, wait, 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 what does that mean? And you'll find people that identify as non-binary, but not trans. And some mm -hmm. people that identify both as non-binary and trans. I remember watching a Facebook video. It was a community video of people in the trans community who have lost loved ones over the years in the trans community through murder, through suicide, you name it. And they kind of had an hour long discussion internally of what that's been like. And one of the guys in the video, like halfway through, was like, I don't know about you guys, but he said, I'm really confused by all these new terms of trans masculine and gender neutral and gender fluid and this and that. He's like, he's like, I don't even know what half of these terms mean. And I'm trans. And they all started laughing and nodding yeah. their heads that even they were mystified by how fast the language was shifting within culture and they themselves couldn't keep up with it. And so I, I think, yeah, it would go a long way to kind of listen understand what those terms mean as that individual understands them to mean. Right. And then we can make sure we're at least speaking the same language here. I mean, if you love somebody, you fall in love with someone and they're from Poland or whatever, you'd probably want to surprise them and learn a little Polish. And so in the same respect, if we do yeah. care about these people, we're going to kind of learn the language, not for the sake of making it our first language, but to be able to have a more intimate, real conversation. What do you think are some gentle but insightful ways that if you're talking with someone who is transgender or is is confused about their sexual or gender identity, what are some paths you think we should walk them down to help them to reconsider the mistaken worldview that they have? Like where, uh, where do you at least start the conversation going? Yeah, I think a lot of times they assume that the church's position is to tell them not to listen to that dysphoria that they're feeling. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. It's wrong. Um, I would propose an opposite approach to that of, of reverent curiosity to mm -hmm. listen to the dysphoria. And what I mean by that, there was an evangelical author uh, named Jay Stringer who came out with a book on breaking free from pornography. And his proposal is that we're going about this all wrong. We're treating it like these unwanted desires and behaviors and fetishes that that's the problem. He said, I don't really think that that's the problem. He said, I think it's the roadmap to the person's healing because it's crying out for an, an, a legitimate unmet need. And if you simply try to white knuckle and shame it, it's right. just going to keep sprouting up because it's just repressed stuff. And, and so I think a similar thing could be done here. I met a young man in Dallas and he identified as trans and we started talking and tell me about your family, like long, pleasant conversation. And he said, oh, well, my family said I had two older sisters and two younger sisters. And he said, you know what? It's like they can do no wrong. It's like my parents love them. They dote over them. They're affectionate to them. But me... It's like, I can never do enough. I'm on the swim team. I got straight A's. I'm in mixed martial arts. And it's like, I'm still the black sheep of the family. Nothing I do is ever. And he was just really venting yeah. and almost tearing up. And I just said to him, I said, do you think that if you were born a female that you would have been loved the way your sisters are loved? And he said, I know I would have been. Mm. And to me, it's like, here we are. You're not aching to be female. You're aching to be loved, but that's the means by which you meet that unmet desire. And so I think we want to help them to listen, like what's going on here? Is it an insecurity? Is it a trauma? Is it an addiction? And that's why we can't take like a cookie cutter approach to this thing because it's as unique as the human person. That's why this relational approach is so important because sometimes there's real trauma underneath there. And sometimes gender dysphoria of it is a dissociative response to handle that trauma because that was inflicted into my female body. But if I had been male when that thing had happened, it never would have happened to me. As a male, I feel strong. I feel safe. It's like, okay, let's go down to these places and see what's going on there. So I think that's our job is with reverent curiosity to help them listen to what some of the roots of these things might be. Yeah. I've noticed that as well, that it seems like, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago when there were cases of gender dysphoria, 
they usually involved young boys mm -hmm. identifying as girls, whereas now the explosion is in teen girls mm -hmm. identifying as male or as boys. But that may be related not so much as a desire to be masculine, but some kind of trauma in relation to being feminine. Is that something you've noticed? Yeah. You know, what you said is absolutely true. Not only a skyrocketing of the cases of gender dysphoria, but an inversion of the sex ratio where it used right. to be young boys and middle-aged men and the men, it was a kind of a different issue, something called autogonophilia for many of them. But right. what we saw now is this massive skyrocketing of rapid onset gender dysphoria of these adolescent girls. A lot of them have autism. In fact, 42% of girls who identify as trans now meet the criterion for an autism diagnosis. And that's a staggering percentage when only 1% yeah. of the population is autistic, 42%. What's going on there? Well, autistic individuals often have very overly rigid thinking patterns. They tend to be a little bit socially awkward. They tend to communicate online more easily and with less anxiety than in person. And so we've got these young girls perhaps going through that. Often they're not dating. They're not holding a boy's hand. They're spending an exorbitant amount of time in private, on screens, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Tumblr, reading and watching these trans influencers. And before you know it, one of their friends says, I'm trans and I'm non-binary and I'm trans. And before you know it, pop, 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 you've got six, seven right. of them in the social circle in this public school setting. And so a lot of these girls, it's not that, like you said, that they, they want to be a boy. It's just that they don't want to be a girl. I mean, the social pressure to be a girl today of the Barbie doll of you got to be sexy, but innocent, and you've got to be assertive, but submissive, and you've got to be successful, but domestic, like all these impossible polar opposites, the balance at the same time, count me out. Al Abigail Schreier said they're fleeing womanhood like a house on fire without a particular destination in mind. That's why so few of them get bottom surgery. They don't necessarily want to look like a guy. They just know I'm done being a woman. Well, just as a quick aside, this is something that I've noticed that I feel awful for teen girls today. I mean, you do chastity talks, you're at high schools all the time. I'm sure you have experience with this. But back in my day, I feel like for both of us, you have a real back in my day. Yeah. I'm sure now you can't use Save by the Bell references in your talks yeah, anymore. It's a little expired, like, yeah. It's it's done and over. But back when you could do that, like back, you know, let's say even 20 years ago before social media. Like, I feel like a lot of the pressure on women, young girl, teen girls for looks is like, oh, well, here's this actress or this model in People magazine or Glamour or something like that in this movie. But now for girls, like you log on, all of your friends are on Instagram and just use makeup and filters and get mm -hmm. likes from your other friends. So it's like the pressure to look a certain, it's not just like some Hollywood actress. It's like everywhere you look women you know are held to like ha like you see your friends that seemingly achieve these impossible standards and you're like i can't mm -hmm. and i just i feel so bad for the situation that they're in right now it's unparalleled yeah it's, it's impossible I, I was listening to one psychologist and he said if you look at the typical anxiety level of today's american teenager he said it's the same anxiety level as a teenager in the 1950s that was admitted to a mental hospital for anxiety disorders. Wow. That's the average of today's teen. And to the extent of time they spend on Instagram, how many likes did I have? Did that person not like me? What's that person gossiping about me? To that extent, they're anxious. I mean, they go to bed at night and the screen goes on and they start scrolling through every other girl's perfect hair and perfect boyfriend and perfect body. And then they just go to bed every night just feeling less than. I mean, the toll of this after years and years is understandable why there's 41,000 girls right now on GoFundMe.com trying to raise money for people to pay for their double mastectomies, 41,000 of them. Wow. This is the fruit to me of that. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about uh, particular circumstances people might find themselves in. Like, let's say you're a parent or you know a parent and they have a child who identifies as transgender. And I feel like the establishment who defends transgender ideology will try to guilt them by saying, if you don't support them, they'll commit suicide. And a phrase they like to use, let's say you have a, a son who says that he's a transgender woman to say, look, would you rather have a live daughter or a dead son? Mm -hmm. And it's just like, it's just this awful emotional blackmail, but yeah. parents want to do what's best for their, their kids. Yeah. So like what, what yeah. should people do in these situations? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the suicide narrative is an extremely powerful tool used by that side. And I think a lot of them have good intentions of like, look, the suicidality rate is very high. Right. Well, the, the reason for that isn't because like all these transphobic bigots that hate your kid. It's because 90% of people who commit suicide have a diagnosable mental health disorder. But right. surgeries and hormones are not the way to treat psychological illnesses. And that's why after they go through the suicide, after they go through the surgery, within about 10 years, the suicide rate climbs 19 times higher than the general population. And if you isolate out the female to male transitioners, the suicide rate is more than 40 times higher. I mean, when you put the girls on puberty blockers, they become more likely to self-harm. And so I, I understand them wanting to take the moral high ground of like, we're saving all these kids' lives. Right. But no, I, I know of one woman in Los Angeles, her daughter ran away because she understood if I can get my mom to lose custody, then the state has to pay for my hormones and surgery. And the, the mother lost custody and was begging, you know, the, 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 the people like, please, my daughter has mental health issues. She has anxiety. She has this, that, that. Please don't put her on these hormones. This will make things worse. She went on the hormones. Sure enough, the mom gets this horrible feeling in her gut and starts calling and looking for the daughter. And they found the daughter's body on train oh, tracks in Los gosh. Angeles. She'd committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And this mother was devastated. She said, look, if you lose your husband, you're called you know, a widow, widow. You know, if you lose your parents, you, you know, you're an orphan, but there isn't even a word for losing your child. Right. It, it, it's nameless because the suffering, yeah. it, it's hard to breathe. And so these folks taking this moral high ground of like, no, if you have gender dysphoria, there's one pathway to resolution and that is transition. And if you are not on board with our one wet lane highway on this, then you're a transphobic bigot and your kid's going to end up committing suicide powerful narrative, but the data shows that it's not the case. More than 80% of the time when a kid experiences gender dysphoria, they will naturally come to identify with their biological sex. Right. But if you put that kid on puberty blockers, almost 100% of the time, will they go on to cross sex hormones, which sterilizes them going from one to the other. And then usually that's not enough. And then they want one surgery before another, another, but 10 years later, they realize they look down at their body and it's like, oh my goodness, what did I do? More right. importantly, what did you adults let, let me, me do? do. Yeah. And that's when the lawsuits now are starting to flood in. Yeah. And I think it's important for us then to make a distinction between people who struggle with gender dysphoria and the advocates who some of them are well-meaning that want to help and others I feel like are taking advantage of mm -hmm. the situation. And it does make me angry because it's insidious that they're the advocates, their position they make it unfalsifiable that if they offer advice and a, a teen does well, well, it's only because of their pro-transgender mm -hmm. advice. Uh, but if the teen doesn't do well, well, it's because we live in a transphobic culture. So mm -hmm. it's heads I win, tails you lose. They, they're always in the right. There's no, no mm -hmm. observation that could yeah. ever show what they're offering is yeah. is harmful. And I think that we have to be able to to show that graciously and, and with the data. Uh, let's let's jump to another issue you have in here about the use of pronouns, because I think then moving from parents, I think another common place where you'll encounter this is if you are an employee, a teacher, a volunteer to parish, a priest, and you have someone who identifies as transgender, one of the first things that comes up is, well, do I use the name you're using? Do I use these pronouns? Uh, what have what have you found to be a helpful approach to this like immediate? OK, we're going to try to have a conversation here. Um, this is where it can be a minefield in and of itself. What have you found to be helpful there? Yeah, in, in one sense, there's some times in which we need to take it on a case-by-case -case basis because some people psychologically are literally so fragile mm -hmm. that if you don't use their name, I mean, they're, they are, you know, could be very suicidal and they'll take right. this like, you hate me and you're shaming you and me, you're dead naming me. And it could incinerate any bridge between you and them. Cause like, nope, you're Robert. You are Robert. I'm not calling you Sally. I'm calling you Robert. I mean, we could exacerbate the dysphoria by being so insistent right. instead of at least taking a middle ground of like, okay, maybe we can kind of come up with an agreed nickname, you know, or maybe we just kind of avoid the issue as much as possible that instead of insisting you're he and you want she, you know, maybe we just try to avoid the pronouns for a while. And, right. you know, eventually it's going to come to a bit of a head. And, and what I recommend saying, if you've got a friend or colleague or whatever that, no, I want this pronoun. I would say something like this, like, look, you know that I love you and you know that I would never want to hurt you. And I understand that this is very important to you, but I also feel like that if I were to use that word, in reference to you, I would feel like I'm lying to you and not being honest with you. And I understand 
that the use of that word for you resonates more deeply with the sense of identity that you feel, but I feel like I would be disingenuous by using that. And I, I know we don't see the eye on this, but I'm not going to reject you because your belief system may be different than mine. And I'm really hoping that you don't reject me because my beliefs are different mm -hmm. than yours. Cause I think the world's a really big place with lots of different beliefs, but we can still stand to learn a lot from each other. Right. And so that way you're kind of putting the opportunity of rejection in their hands, instead of saying, I'm rejecting you. It's like, I won't reject you. Although we don't see eye to eye, because if I disagree with you, it doesn't mean I hate you. It means I love you and respect you enough to share my beliefs with you, hoping right. you'll, you know, and, and sometimes it works. I mean, I, I know of one woman and her nephew is transitioning or niece and, uh, and the, the aunt was like, now, you know, I'm not on board of all this stuff. And so I, I'm not, I'm not comfortable using that name. Is that all right with you? And he's like, well, cause you're auntie, I'll let it slide. Okay. And so they had a relationship yeah. there that allowed a little bit of give and take there that, that she wasn't going to beat him over the head. And he was realizing, okay, you're my aunt. I've known for the last 12 years, you really love me. And yeah. so I'll let it slide. And so I think we've got to invest in the relationship instead of insisting this is what you will be called. And there's some cases where I think it would be objectively wrong to use their birth name. And, and a case like that would be, uh, for example, you had a coworker and everybody thought, he was female, but you found out that, oh, that's a biological male. And then you start, you know, hey, Bob, how you doing, Bob? You know, that person might be like, wait a minute. I don't want all my coworkers to know that I right. used to be male. It would be a very clear act of Christian lack of charity to do that. And so I think in those cases, hey, build a relationship. And, you know, when that person, if and when they want to come out with that information, that's their business. Your right. job is just to love that person and know that if Jesus Christ were here, he'd be going to dinner with these folks. He'd be playing cards with them. Like he'd be entering into their life instead of treating them like they have leprosy. Right. And, and I think some people might uh, have a thought about that. Well, how could that be wrong for me to, to say it's true? So what's the big deal? Well, we have to remember that as Catholics, we believe we, there's uh, calumny and detraction. Mm -hmm. And so to understand uh, the difference between them, the L and calumny, uh, stands for a lie, and the T in detraction stands for the truth. So calumny, we know you tell a lie about somebody that hurts them. Yeah, don't do that. But you can tell a truth about someone that hurts them. Like if somebody does something really embarrassing, like oh, I didn't lie, like, yeah, but they don't need to know about that. Yeah. That would be mm -hmm. the sin of detraction. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody is struggling with gender dysphoria and they haven't fully revealed this, like the case that you've you've given – then this might seem like, okay, this isn't an opportunity. Like, I don't have the right to reveal this particular mm. struggle that they're undergoing. So mm. I'm going to refrain from that. And maybe you you use a mental reservation or, or something else like that. Uh, but but I, I understand. Like, for me, when I, when I look at this, what's funny, and the church doesn't have a definitive teaching on this, so, like, everybody has to make their own kind of judgment call. My thoughts are I'm more inclined to use new names because people have all kinds of names, like names can be Apple. Yeah. Yeah. Though there's, <laughs> there's, there's Hollywood there's, kids. Yeah. Yeah. There are names that can be non-binary. There's, you know, yeah. Pat, Terry, there's names that could yeah. be, you know, whatever. Yeah. Pronouns. I have a little bit of a harder time with. And when I try to meet common ground with people, like sometimes I'll try to just use like the singular they, uh, yeah. to avoid, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, yeah. uh, other things, but, but I think you're right that as long as our goal is to move the conversation forward. Uh, and so as long as we are not servicing a false ideology merely because we want to acquiesce to it, we have to learn how to, you know, you have to learn to pick and choose these battles. It's like when I talk about the issue of abortion with people and they say like, don't, don't call it a baby. That's, that's triggering to me. Okay, fine. I'm not going to say baby. I'm just going to say, I'll say fetus that because that's true. Also yeah. mm -hmm. let's have our conversation, yeah. uh, you know? And so I think maybe you're right that when we, I guess, as you've learned in writing this book and talking to people, there really is a tightrope walk between truth and charity on this issue, isn't there? Yeah, there is. And so, like I said, it kind of case by case basis and it's hard, but we got to realize this is more of a marathon than a sprint. Yeah. And I think we want these silver bullet approaches, but this is one that requires a different approach of, of walking with these individuals. You know, it, it, there's the idea that, well, you either accept this person or you are abandoning them. You know, you right. either affirm them or reject them. It's like, well, no, 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 no. Um, how about accompaniment? How about walking with this person in right. truth and love? And it's going to, there's going to be some tension, but I think if, if you speak the truth of them, it's going to stir up res some resentment right now. 
But I think if you don't speak the truth to them when the time is appropriate, they are going to resent you so much more Later. 10 years from now, 15 years or in eternity when it's like, you knew, you knew all alone. This was not the path that would lead to human flourishing. And you just patted me along because you just, just didn't want to ruffle any feathers. Right. Like there's very few people often in their lives that will challenge them in some of these thinking patterns in, in a very loving way. Cause they could all, often hop online and find a community of support or go to some Alliance club on campus where people will tell you whatever the heck you want to hear. But I don't know about you, but in my life, I'd rather have just a couple solid people that'll shoe straight with me, even if I don't want to hear it, right. than surrounding myself with hordes of people who just tell me whatever I want to hear. That's not authentic friendship. It's simply false compassion because when you love somebody, you just can't lie to them. And so I would try to think in terms of the resentment, try to think 10 years down the road, not simply 10 minutes after the conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Last question or issue that I want to bring up is when we talk to people who especially identify as transgender or very sympathetic to it, uh, how helpful do you think it is to bring up the issue of gender nonconformity? Because I feel like a lot of times somebody yeah. may feel like, well, I, you know, I'm, even though I'm a biological male, I identify as female or I'm a woman. And I would ask why. And I think a lot of times it's just because that, you know, in either case, people reject like a very rigid mm -hmm. understanding of masculinity or a rigid understanding of femininity. Because, yeah, I guess a question I've always had for those who defend this ideology, like what is the real difference between a transgender woman who would be a biological man who identifies as a woman and a gender nonconforming man, which would be a man who just acts like a woman? Like mm -hmm. when you look, if you looked at both of them with a surveillance camera, in many cases, they would be almost, they might both wear dresses, both enjoy yeah. feminine things. But yeah. like, what is the re the real difference here is the case that maybe you think like, well, I am a woman. Well, what, what does that mean? Or does that just mean there are certain feminine things that you, yeah. you enjoy that just are not as stereotypical? Yeah. You know, and so a good question to ask is like, can you give me a definition or an explanation of gender that doesn't rely upon gender stereotypes? And, you right. know, it's like they really have to think that through because, yeah, as a result of these overly rigid gender stereotypes of our culture, if you're a real man, you're into drinking beer and shooting deer, watching NASCAR. What if I'm not into all that stuff? You know, is the answer that I need to change my, dinner, I, uh, my identity or to identify as something else or change my body? No. If you really think about it, these overly rigid gender stereotypes try to get people to conform their personality to match their body. And otherwise, mm -hmm. your body is this. Your personality should be that. That's not healthy. But then gender theory does the opposite. It tries to get people to get their body to match their personality. Meaning your personality is this. We need to change your body to match that. And so to me, neither approach is healthy. What right. we've got to do is realize th that, you know, I remember one feminist said a woman is a person with a female body and any personality, not a person with a female personality and any body, which kind of gets us to the root that the body is you. The body is not meaningless. It is meaningful. Right. And so we can, it's real. It's reliable. Gender theory says, look, you know, if you feel a and lack of congruence here, the problem is not your mind. The problem is your body. You know, the body doesn't reveal reality. Truth reveals reality or feelings reveal reality. So to be true to yourself, you follow down the feelings path. And so I think what we've got to do is instead of changing the body, maybe we need to ease up a little bit on these overly rigid gender stereotypes. I had lunch with a, a nun last year and she was a nun, a doctor, a surgeon, and a colonel in the United States army. And I'm oh, like, wow. you just not want to be an astronaut because you're lazy, like, or just want to hog all the vocations yourself. <laughs> Excuse but, me, sister, doctor, <laughs> Colonel Maria. I have a question. Yeah, exactly. It's like, but she wasn't like doing those things instead of motherhood. I mean, she was yeah. mothering through these things, kind yeah. of proving that womanhood isn't some little box you have to fit into. It's a firm foundation upon which you can stand revealed through your body that you can bloom into whoever God created you. But there's room to be a tomboy, but there isn't anymore. There, you could be a tomboy 15 years ago, but the category doesn't even exist anymore because we've had gender stereotypes become too rigid. And that's what's so weird to me is that if... Uh, a conservative or, you know, let's say someone who does not believe in transgender ideology, you know, sees a boy playing with dolls, like stop it. That's a girly thing. People will say, stop imposing your, your values on them. You're so narrow minded. But if a gender theorist sees that they'll say, oh, well, he's, he's, uh, that's revealing his inner gender identity as female. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, 
one side is allowed to use gender stereotypes, uh, but the other is is criticized for it. Maybe both sides just give it up. Yeah, I mean, and, and hopefully that's that's where this will lead us to, to a fuller understanding mm -hmm. of what it means to be made in female in the image and likeness of God. I mean, you look at the communion of, of saints. I mean, they were so radically human and unique where some were just the pinnacle of feminine femininity and other people are Joan of Arc or whatever. You I was know, about I mean, to say, had, there's yeah. Therese of Lisieux and St. Joan of Arc are both godly women. You yeah. know, but there's a there's a uh, it's a big tent to to yeah. fill out that particular gender role. Yeah. And so I think we need to allow our boys, if they're into theater and poetry and dance and art, to show up to their plays and cheer for them like they scored the state touchdown, you know, in the championship. Like we need to realize that these things have become so rigid that they're causing people to question their own humanity, that even these body parts even belong. And and this is a difficult road for these individuals. You know, some people, it's not just no, no, it's not just I like guy things, like I am a guy. It is deep in me. And so right you know, just saying, oh, well, you just like feminine things or guy things. Sometimes it just goes a lot it's deeper. deeper than that. And sure. so that's why it's important that we really listen to everybody's story because it's all too easy to hear a couple anecdotes and then kind of apply that to everybody. Yeah. But that's the importance of listening in these conversations. Uh, real fast. So on um, supporting you know our, our sons, if they want to be in theater, I feel like I my life is going to end up being like the reverse of like the eighties dad who is the big football star. Who's mad. His kid is in drama. Like yeah. I, my, the only letter on a letterman's jacket I ever got was for the drama club and academic yeah. decathlon. And yeah. so I feel like I'm going to, my sitcom life would be, I dropped my son off where I think is theater practice. And then he tells me, dad, I quit theater three months ago. I'm, I'm the captain of the football team. And I'm like, yeah. how could you betray me like this? <laughs> yeah, Don't yeah. you know how musical theater runs in our family? <laughs> and so, yeah. It, you know, and any, I'll say <laughs> the, the most ahead. masculine man I've ever met in my life was deeply into theater and poetry and art and is Pope John Paul II. You know, and he just had the pleasure of living in a culture that didn't define men who were into theater and poetry and art as being unmasculine. There was room in that culture to express your masculinity in those ways. If you think you cannot be a masculine man and engage in musical theater, I have two words for you, Hugh Jackman. So that's all I'm, <laughs> so I would say that is a, a manly, manly man who uh, musical theater does not diminish masculinity. Yeah. The book is called Male, Female, Other, A Catholic Guide to yeah. Understanding Gender by Jason Everett. Uh, where can people get a copy of it? I uh, just go to chastity.com uh, and also at chastity.com slash gender. It's kind of a page where we house a lot of resources for families or individuals, schools, churches, wondering about policies, parents looking for support networks. You could get the book there. So just chastity.com to find the book or chastity.com slash gender for a ton of resources if you or loved one uh, is wrestling with this issue. All righty. Thank you so much, Jason. And people can go to chastity.com as well if they would like to book you to speak at their school or their church, for example. Absolutely. And we're doing uh, an incredible amount of inquiries are coming in right now for universities and churches. Can you come talk to our community about this gender thing? And so we're doing those every single week now. And so we're, we're happy to come to any parish, church, conference, or school. Oh, wow. Very good. Thank you so much. Male, female, other, go to chastity.com or chastity.com slash gender to get your copy. Thank you guys for listening. And I hope you all have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.